All right, let's start. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Corbin Kovalt. I'm the co-chair of the Department of Physics. Welcome to our first colloquium of the uh, of the fall 2021 season. Um, I'm speaking just for a couple seconds uh, in my role as the uh, as the quote unquote instructor for the uh, for the course of uh, Physics 666. Uh, this is a uh, voluntary, mandatory, zero credit hour. Uh, you only can pass, you can't fail, but we, uh, class, uh, it is essentially a mechanism for us to warmly and gently encourage our, all of our graduate students to participate in our weekly seminars, uh, since we think this is a central uh, and essential component of their scholarly training and activity and involvement in the department. And uh, we're delighted to have such an interesting and great uh, colloquium to start off the seminar, start off the colloquium series this year. So uh, thanks again and welcome to all the new, all the graduate students, old and new. Thank you. Okay, thanks Corbin. And indeed, welcome to the first colloquium and of the academic year. And exactly as Corbin said, we're off to a great start uh, having our speaker as uh, Professor Chandralekha Singh of the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Professor Singh did her undergraduate work at the Indian Institute of Technology in Kharagpur. She did her PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, the field of condensed matter physics um, is said to be divided by HBAR, but Professor Singh has worked on both sides of that divide on subjects ranging from quantum correlated systems uh, to problems of classical statistical mechanics, such as self-organized criticality. Uh, the main focus of her research now is on physics education, an area in which she's done important work and is a national leader. I would especially like to draw attention to her research on the barriers to the participation of women and traditionally underrepresented groups in physics. Uh, Professor Singh is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a president of the American Association of Physics Teachers. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. Uh, so welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Harsh. Uh, I would like to say that I'm the past president of the American Association of Physics Teachers. So, um, you know, I was the president until the winter meeting this year. All right, so uh, I am delighted to be here. And, you know, if you wanna ask me questions as we go along, that is fine too. So just unmute yourself and ask your questions. I don't ch uh, check the chat. All right, so let's get started. And I wanted to actually start out by some work that we have been doing on cognitive issues in learning physics, as opposed to like, you know, other things that Harsh mentioned, which I'm gonna talk about in, my, in the second half of my presentation. So let me start out by my research study that focuses on what does it mean to think like a physicist? So, you know, we, when we teach students, we are trying to help them learn to think like a physicist, but we really need to actually articulate and be able to think about what is it that we are really uh, thinking or striving to do when we say that we are helping students think uh, to learn to think like a physicist. So this study actually was difficult to conduct because we needed to find some problems which put physics faculty in the same situation in which students are in the sense that we wanted them to be able to think on their feet and we wanted to see them actually struggling with the problem and trying to actually do them. And we wanted to see what kinds of strategies they would use and how they would go about doing problems that they don't have intuitions about. And how would that be different from those of students? Because if we gave them the same problem that they have always given to their students and that have become automatic for them, then it's not really actually problem solving, then it's just doing some exercise. And that would not help you learn what it means to think like a physicist and how is it that physics faculty solve problems. So in order to do that, we found a couple of problems. So I'm gonna talk about one problem. And so this problem was given to 20 physics faculty and a lot of students. And here is the problem. You have a wheel that is spinning and it spins for some time and then it falls on the ground and then you know it's uh, it slips for some time and then finally it starts to roll without slipping and the question is when it once it starts to roll without slipping when v final becomes equal to r times omega final how would this final speed depend upon how much was the coefficient of kinetic friction on this surface assuming there is some friction on the surface so i want you to take 30 seconds to think about this and 
And if you wanted to share your thoughts on in the chat, that would be fine. So what do you think? Like if suppose the coefficient of kinetic friction was more on the surface, would it mean that the final speed would be more or less or about the same? Anybody wanted to share their thoughts? Okay, I see one thought. I mean, it turns out in the interest of time and since we are on Zoom, otherwise I would have asked you to talk to a person next to you and you know form a small group. It turns out the correct answer here is the final speed actually does not depend upon the coefficient of kinetic friction. And that is because there are two things here. One is, you know, how much is that, you know, how much is the frictional force? But the other one is how long does it take for the wheel to, you know, lock and start to roll, right? I mean, how, how long will it slip? And the, so regardless of friction, since these two things, like the frictional coefficient and the time are conspiring in the opposite direction, the total amount of energy that is dissipated in the form of heat and other things would be the same regardless of friction. And you can see that in two ways. You know, you can either look at the conservation of angular momentum about the point where the wheel first touches the ground. And since angular momentum is conserved and the frictional force is passing about uh, through that point, you know, it cannot produce a torque. And so the angular, you know, angular momentum is conserved and the final speed should not depend upon the coefficient of friction. But you can also use uh, equations of linear kinematics, angular kinematics, and then equate them using this and you will see that the frictional coefficient will drop out. Now, what we found is that, you know, physics faculty did have difficulty thinking on their feet because we literally gave them problems on a sheet of paper and we were sitting in their office and asking them, how would you solve these problems? So this, so we did feel that, you know, that they were struggling to solve this problem in the sense that, you know, they had to do thinking on their feet, but at the same time, it was clear that they really did know how to think like a physicist in the sense that they were thinking about limiting cases. What happens when there's no friction or there's inf infinite amount, inf uh, the frictional coefficient is infinite. It's, it's true that in this case, these extreme cases don't help you, but it's still a very good heuristic that we should be teaching our students. Similarly, they were thinking about analogies with familiar situations. What happens to the wheels of an airplane when it touches the ground? You know, How does the frictional coefficient actually determine the final speed at which it will start to roll without slipping. These are again, very good things that we should be helping our students uh, do, making use of analogies. They also were very systematic in terms of doing a conceptual analysis of the problem. Some of them even went to the board and they started to actually draw diagrams and things, something that we should explicitly be encouraging by rewarding students for those kinds of things. Also, they thought about like, you know, what is given, what, where they were going, and thought about what principles of physics to use. And many people even thought about the angular momentum conservation. Of course, it's a tricky thing because you have to think about the point about which angular momentum is conserved. But when we now start thinking about what were the students doing in the interviews, we found that they were having great difficulty and oftentimes they were going in circles. So unless we reward students for being systematic in their approach, the way that physicists were, even in situation in which their intuition failed and they had to actually think on their feet, we actually would not really help students develop problem solving reasoning and metacognitive skills. So the point is we need to reward them for this kind of thinking. We need to actually, if we don't give them points for these kinds of things, students are not going to learn to be systematic in their approach. And in that case, they are not really going to actually learn to think like a physicist. I also would like to say that in the same problem, we also gave to both students and faculty, sorry, in the same study, a ballistic pendulum problem. So this is this one. You know, you have two putties which are, uh, you know, hanging from a ceiling. One of them is raised to a certain height. It goes down, collides with the other one, and the two things go up. And the question is asking, how, how, how do you find the final height in terms of the initial height? And they were, you know, this question was given in open-ended format at the University of Pittsburgh, and it was given in multiple choice format to students in 14 different universities, I mean, about 2000 students. And 
you can see that after instruction, only 27% of the students said that you need to use both mechanical energy conservation and linear momentum conservation. So when the thing is going down, you have to use mechanical energy conservation and right before the thing collides with the other one, once you know the uh, final speed of this thing going down because the initial speed for this collision problem, which is then you know when you find the final of the inelastic collision, then that becomes the initial for the thing going up, which is again, something you can solve using conservation of mechanical energy. Now, wh what do you think? When faculty were looking at this problem on a sheet of paper, do you think that they even read the full problem? No, I mean, just by like literally looking at a few words, they, they actually said, you know, you would be using both of these principles to solve this problem because this is a problem about which they don't they have a lot of intuition because this is the kind of problem that you give to your students a lot why is it that the students actually struggle with this problem equally so if you looked at the open-ended uh, problem this problem versus the spinning wheel problem the university of pittsburgh students did about the same and and you can see that the final score of the students from uh, two, some 2000 students from 14 different universities is not very good it's only slightly better than just guessing and in fact even those people who said my students will really ace this particular problem because i have even done exactly the same problem on the board their students did not end up doing better than other people's students and so you know one of the things is that faculty often evaluate the difficulty of a problem from their own perspective as opposed to the perspective of the students that they are teaching and this is a huge problem in teaching and learning because we need to put ourselves in our students' shoes to think about the difficulty of the problem. Otherwise, we'll think that this problem is really easy when it's not. Just think about it. It's a problem which has three temp three parts, three sub problems that are temporarily separated. You know, like the thing going down and right before the collision takes place here, then the collision part, and then again these two things stuck together going up. And the final of one thing becomes the initial of the other thing. Students are having great difficulty with this. You know, many of them think that it's just energy conservation or just momentum conservation, but not both, as you can see here, right? Either this, this, or one of these. And so if you think that this is a really easy problem compared to that spinning, spinning wheel problem, because you have thought about it a lot, you are going to actually not be able to provide the optimal guidance, support, and scaffolding to your students. So what I wanted to um, conclude then, conclude with it about this, is that the perceived difficulty of a problem not only depends upon its inherent complexity, but also how much familiarity and intuition you have built about it. This is really important for optimal scaffolding. All right, so let me move on to another uh, research study. And this is again, reflection on problem solving. So problem solving is a learning opportunity, but oftentimes, you know, problem solving can be a missed learning opportunity if students don't reflect upon what kinds of things they haven't gotten got they have not gotten correct in their problem solving process. For example, in a quiz situation, or in a homework situation, or in an exam situation. And so the question is: Should we be actually deliberately prompting students to correct their mistakes by giving them some points? in order to help them use the problem solving as learning opportunity and help them learn to um, think about what they have done wrong and repair and organize and extend their knowledge structure. And so, you know, we did some um, studies in introductory physics, and this was done by, with, uh, with my colleagues, uh, Edith Yellow-Shalmi and Betsheva Lon from the yeah, Weizmann Institute. And what we found in introductory physics is that when we actually gave to students some points for correcting their mistakes on quizzes, on weekly quizzes. And then if similar kinds of problems were given on the exam, not exactly the same problem, but similar kinds of problems that use the same principles of physics, students end up ended up doing a lot better on them than if they were just provided the correct solution, but not given any incentives to correct their mistakes. Okay, notice the students who are given the incentive to correct their mistakes, also were provided the correct solution, but only after they had taken the time to correct their mistakes, you know, using their textbooks and notes and things like that. So this is something that we knew from introductory context. We wanted to see if the same kind of thing is necessary in quantum mechanics concept, context. And this is 
a junior senior level course or is it that you know advanced students in quantum mechanics will voluntarily reflect upon what they did incorrectly on quizzes and uh, exams and will they check their work and learn from them on their own by looking at you know the correct solution provided with what they had done so in order to do this again you know we actually selected four problems from two different midterms and basically this study was done over four years when in one year students were asked to correct their mistake in another year not then yes they were asked to correct their mistake in the other year not and we wanted to see if we gave similar problems later in the final exam will students end up doing better if students were asked to correct their mistakes notice that you know all students regardless of whether they were asked to correct their mistakes or not were provided the correct answer anyway okay so here i'm showing you how the students end up doing ended up doing so this is comparison group means the group that didn't correct their mistake and this is the incentivized group which was given some great incentive to correct their mistakes and pre means how did they did the first time around this is for all students low medium and high refers to students who didn't do as well in the first round or did somewhere in the middle and did really well and post means how how they did the second time around right and you can see that incentivized group is actually doing a lot better when they had not when those students had not done well the first time or even in the medium performing group the first time around right i mean like they they are doing a lot better so no if you look at the post here compared to post here the post here is much better for the incentivized group in the low and medium pretest category, whereas the pretest uh, scores are pretty similar in the two cases. Of course, we don't expect that that much difference in the high group. So notice again that even in the context of quantum mechanics, giving incentives to students to correct their mistakes is really helping students learn these things much better so that they perform much better on a later exam. And so I recommend that you do this kind of thing in your courses especially in advanced courses, instructors didn't have too much work to do because the second time around when you gave them the thing back on, on say a Friday and asked them to bring it back on Monday by looking at your uh, books, books and notes, you were asked to correct your mistakes. And then when you brought your uh, second round of uh, solutions back, you were given the correct answers. That time students were much more interested in knowing what they had done wrong and learning from their mistakes. So all that struggling that took place on the weekend, trying to figure out what they had done incorrectly on the midterm exam was really productive for the students, and especially the ones who needed the help, low and the medium group. Because otherwise, just because you provide them with the solution, students are not learning as much. And in fact, we even interviewed six students who were in the comparison group uh, uh, who had not done well the second time about why they didn't actually do well on the same problems when the solutions were provided. And they sent, they said things like, oh, I didn't look at the solutions uh, because I don't like to look at it when I do poorly. Or, you know, I don't expect the kinds of things that are on the midterm, those same concepts to show up on the final exam or something like that. But the point is that even quantum mechanics has a very well-defined knowledge structure. And we want students to develop a robust knowledge structure of quantum mechanics so saying this would not be on the exam and that would be on the exam and I'm only doing selective study for the problems that will be on the exam is not really what we want students to do. And so giving them incentives to correct their mistakes will go a long way in helping the students who are actually otherwise not necessarily going to do best. And it's really good because it's going to re reduce the gap with it between the students who already are doing well and the ones who need help. Please, uh, Bob, do you have questions? So the the Bob that you're asking is me. Yeah, sorry, you had you had raised your hand or something. I oh I I didn't, but actually, you know what? I'm glad that you thought I did raise my hand because I was just going to say that, you know, this connects with something that Kathy understands better than I. Now she's really done work on it and published on it, but it's this post-exam syndrome that we have, where you know one. Thing, one thing we, we love to do is after every exam for the next very, the next homework problem is to, uh, to redo the exam, discuss it, look at it, tell us why you made the mistakes you did and to give you incentive to revisit it because 
I remember myself, I hated to look at the exam if I had done poorly. Yeah, thank you. So I think that you're absolutely right. So, you know, doing it for all of the exams, all, of, you know, even for the quizzes, I think would be a really great thing to do. Yes, that's, that's definitely good. Thank you. So, yeah, I think Kathy has also done some work in this area. So thank you that you pointed out this. Um, so, uh, so, so now I'm going to move on to talking about my uh, research on student conceptual difficulties in learning quantum mechanics. So, you know, as you know, even if students are experts in classical mechanics, it, once they go and get into quantum mechanics, you know, they're again going to be the same kinds of difficulties because the paradigm of classical and quantum mechanics are so different. So in Hilbert space, no one can hear you scream. So their position, momentum, you know, like you just thought that you had really developed a good understanding of those things from your classical mechanics course. And now these things are operators in an abstract space where, you know, and these things, you know, the out, when you do measurement, then you get some, you know, outcomes, but those things are all probabilistic. So all of this stuff is like so different from what the students are familiar with. It's not surprising that students start having a lot of difficulty. So my collaborator and I, we wrote an article on improving student understanding of quantum mechanics. And in this particular paper, we were looking at taxonomy of student difficulties. And basically, let me give you a couple of examples and then talk about what are the kinds of things we have been doing to help students develop a robust understanding of quantum physics. So for example, if uh, one of the questions that was asked to students from nine different universities, and this was more than 200 students uh, in the upper level courses, or some of them were even graduate students. And the question was basically, okay, if the if the state of the system is a linear superposition of ground state and first excited state, in this case of infinite square well, like this, then what are the probabilities of measuring different values of energy? And what we found is that across those different uh, schools, 67% of the students provided the correct response. But the same question the sec had a second part which said, what is the expectation value of energy in this state? And in this case, you can see that the student res correct response actually went down to 39%. So why is it that the response went down so much? And why would this, these questions be juxtaposed next to each other? So we were thinking that students would just use the answer to part A, and they would say that expectation value is the average of a large number of measurements on identically prepared systems. And if that is the thing, then the expectation value of energy would be the probability of measuring the energy E1, which is 2, 7 times E1, plus the probability of measuring energy E2, which is 5, 7 times E2. And, and there's nothing else. The probability of everything else is zero. So that's the answer for ex what the expectation value of energy should be. But most students actually didn't use this conceptual approach of thinking of expectation value or as an average of a large number of measurements on identically prepared systems. Instead, they use the fact that, you know, expectation value of any observable is integral psi star operator for corresponding to that psi and overall space. And so in this particular case, they put the Hamiltonian operator in the middle and, you know, but when they started to solve, there was something, there was something or the other that went wrong. For example, some people forgot there was complex conjugate involved. Some people forgot that there was orthonormality involved. Some people, you know, if this is an infinite square well, then the limits will be finite. And so some people forgot that there was an integral involved. And so ultimately only 39% of the students provide the correct response. So again, we have to think very carefully about what we are really helping our students learn. If we are only teaching students to do some things algorithmically, like, you know, okay, anytime you see a problem related to expectation value, start doing this kind of an integral or start doing this or that, you know, people will go through some kind of a complicated process of solving that problem, as opposed to if we actually also help them think about conceptual meaning of uh, expectation value and how they could exploit their answer to the previous part to actually do this. Similarly, this problem was actually asking them to find to, to, to whether the probability density you know, for measuring position was going to depend upon time. 
in this superposition of ground state and first excited state of infinite square well. And so in this case, again, probability density should depend upon time because each of these you know, uh, stationary states will have their own time dependent phase factors, e to the power minus i e one t over h bar, e to the power minus i e two t over h bar. When we take the absolute square of the thing, there will be cross terms. But again, you can see that only 43% of the students, the more than 400 to 200 students from nine different universities provided the correct response. And most of them actually put an overall incorrect time, time dependent phase factor. And you can see again, the difficulty is coming from thinking of the state as though it was a stationary state, as though it was an energy eigenstate. And again, if we really think about the way we are teaching quantum mechanics, if the course in quantum mechanics turns out to be nothing but one after the other, helping students do one time independent Schrodinger equation after the other, one is infinite square well, one is finite square well, one is harmonic oscillator, then delta function potential, then hydrogen atom and everything else, then it's not surprising that after some time, students don't know what to make of like linear superpositions and they think of everything, even if it's a linear superposition of stationary states, they think of it as something that only has an overall time dependent phase factor. So people think that, you know, the only time that there is a non-trivial time dependence to the system is when you are actually looking at um, some time dependent perturbation theory or something. And that is obviously not the case here. So the conclusion was that students are having common difficulty and these difficulties are strikingly common, uh, uh, strikingly universal in nature to the kinds of difficulties that have been found in introductory physics. So we wanted to actually help students develop a solid grasp of these con concepts. And so we basically wanted to use these difficulties as a resource, as a guide to develop some learning tools. And we wanted to make sure that whatever we are doing is commensurate with students' prior knowledge. So there is good impedance matching going on here. So we are developing quantum interactive learning tutorials, and these are based upon findings of student difficulties in quantum mechanics. And they use a guided approach to learning that builds on students' prior knowledge. So this is an inquiry-based guided learning sequence. And hints and feedback are provided as needed and the goal is to bridge the gap between the conceptual and quantitative aspects of quantum mechanics. We often use computer-based visualization tools, which are adapted from those that have been done by um, uh, my collaborators and also from other sources. Also, you know, like each of these uh, quilts comes with uh, a pretest and post-test. So for example, this is the time evolution quilt. And again, in the pretest, students might be asked for the probability density uh, after time t and whether it depends upon time for a stationary state and for a non-stationary state like this, which is a linear superposition of stationary states. Now, if suppose, you know, like students said that both of these cases, the probability density shouldn't depend upon time, at the beginning of the quill, students will actually go through, you know, a simulation where they will actually see whether their prediction is correct or not. So in this case, I'm showing you time-lapse picture of psi star psi as a function of position at various times. So this is t equal to zero and this is future times. And you can see that students will see that the probability density actually depends upon time. So if they didn't predict this, and if they thought that it should actually not depend upon time because there was just an overall time dependent phase factor, now you have caused a co cognitive conflict and created a state of disequilibrium. So at this point, it is a good time to help guide students through the, these learning sequences where they will understand how Hamiltonian of the system plays a critical role when it comes to time dependence. And, you know, because the time dependent Schrodinger equation is, you know, like uh, shows that the Hamiltonian governs the time evolution and then help them think about how, if the state is not a stationary state, how the probability density would depend upon time and then have them actually practice this in lots of different contexts. And I'll show you like how students did in the pretest, which was after traditional instruction and post-test after working on these on the quilt. And here also I'm showing you student performance on many different quilts after, after, after they have worked on the quilts. And this is right after traditional instruction. And you can see that student performance is much better. If any of you is interested in any of these things, I can send them to you. They're all on Fizzport. So you can download it from there, any, any of these things. And these are just some of the subsets of all the things that we have developed already. By the way, we are also developing these clicker question sequences. And again, if you're interested in clicker question sequences, we have it for both semesters of quantum mechanics 
And I, I'm just showing you one example for infinite square well. And if you look at the percentage of students as a function of their score, this, um, this red thing here is the case in which students only had traditional instruction. These are two different classes taught by two different instructors in which they use clicker question sequences. And you can see that student performance is significantly better. So this is again, another tool that you can use in your class. So at this point, I would like to move on to talking about my work on improving students' self-efficacy, sense of belonging and intelligence mindset in introductory physics. And this is work done with uh, these people and Emily already talked about it last year. So uh, let me uh, say what I mean by self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is students' belief in their ability to succeed in a particular task, course, or subject area. And it can impact students' per persistence and engagement. And it can also affect their performance even after controlling for their knowledge and skill. Okay, And it can also affect, uh, affect how much time they spend on something. Because if you think that you're not good at something, you're not going to want to do that. You keep procrastinating. So before I talk about that, let me show you this famous picture that you're already familiar with. But one of the things that I wanted to show is that there's only one woman in this picture and all of the people here are white. So if a student who doesn't look like any of these people, you know, comes and starts learning physics, they would actually be concerned about whether they have what it takes to excel, whether they are in the right place or not. And if you look at a recent conference in physics like this one, you know, it doesn't look that different from that one, right? So the situation in physics is still not that different. And there are all kinds of stereotypes in physics in terms of like who belongs here, who can excel here. And those kinds of things can create stereotype threats. That means threat associated with, you know, your affiliation with a particular group. So I can say, oh, I'm a woman. And maybe I'm struggling because I don't see other role models like me. I don't see that many women. You know, how when did I see a law of physics that was actually named after a woman? So maybe people like me are not supposed to be here. And that's why I'm struggling. Instead of thinking that struggling is actually a good thing, it's a stepping stone to learning something new. I should be continuing to do challenging problems. I should be patting myself on the myself on the back and saying, yes, I'm on my way to learning something new. This would be called growth mindset. When I'm actually thinking that struggling is going to make my brain grow, it is actually going to make me smarter as opposed to, no, it's a sign that I'm not good at something. And the point is that people who are underrepresented, who don't have role models, they are more likely to collapse into the state where they think of intelligence as something immutable. They look at those pictures and they're like, no, I don't see myself being reflected here. Maybe I'm an outlier. Maybe I'm not supposed to be here. And if you look at self-efficacy, even in introductory physics, this is a picture that I'm sorry, this is a, a graph from uh, introductory physics. And this is what it is at the beginning. This is what it is at the end of one year introductory physics course. Vertical axis is showing the self-efficacy. And you see that women, which is the blue one at the bottom, are much lower than men, right? In fact, if you look at the effect sizes, they are pretty large. So there is a large difference in self-efficacy. And notice that self-efficacy itself is important because it can actually drive you out of a field even if you actually are doing just fine. In fact, my own research is also showing that women who actually have B grade on average are quitting physics. This is gonna come out very soon in Journal of College Science Teaching. Women are leaving with the B grade, when, whereas men are staying with C grade. So, so the point is that, you know, I think that uh, you can even have a fine grade, but you may have this nagging feeling that you're not doing well, unless you are recognized, unless somehow the instructors are doing something to make it clear to you that struggling is a good thing. That is a normal thing. You know, that's what you should experience and that is perfectly fine and keep actually validating you and affirming all of the things that you are going through in the process because otherwise people who are not actually represented in a discipline are more likely than not to drop out so these are some of the things that women have said about you know we have a lot of these kinds of quotes these are not some cherry pick quotes and you can see that they're questioning whether they belong so one of the things that we wanted to do because and by the way, right now I'm teaching a two semester junior senior level quantum mechanics course and I'm doing this intervention even there. 
And if you're interested, I can tell you what are the adaptation I've done, ad adaptations I've done. But let me tell you about the introductory physics course. This is basically for science and engineering majors. And so 65% of the students here are engineers and the rest are physics, chemistry, and math majors. And so these are also the first year students, right? So they are just on campus, like first year, first semester. And they're wondering, you know, whether this is the right course for them, this is the right school for them. And so we took this field tested method that has already been shown to be very effective in math courses at the high school level. And it's a really short 25 minute activity that you can do at the beginning of the course, one time activity. Of course, you yourself as an instructor or teaching assistant should have a growth mindset. By growth mindset, I mean, you should see potential in all of your students. You should actually, you know, make sure that you are not thinking that, oh, I'm here to teach only the top 25% of the students and I'm not going to be catering to the rest of them. Because if you have that notion, your students are not going to do well. They, you know, this thing is going to like be conveyed to them by osmosis. So the point is, and in fact, there was study done like in 2018, it came out, came out by Mary Murphy from Indiana University. She did it with 150 student, 150 faculty and more than 10,000 students across different STEM disciplines. And what she saw is that at the beginning of the semester, when she gave a survey to the faculty, asking them whether they believed in the potential of all of the students in their classes and whether, whether they were trying to actually inspire and help all students learn, or whether they were just catering to the top few. The instructors who said, oh no, I mean, to be really frank, you know, only a few students in my class will do well. Th those who endorse those kinds of beliefs, literally, that's exactly what ended up happening. So it was self-fulfilling prophecy. And in fact, the gap between my minority and majority students was really large. On the other hand, the instructors who said, no, my job is to actually inspire all students and I work really hard. I give them good study tips. I actually you know, uh, help them become deliberate learners. I reward students for the kinds of things that I value and I think uh, will be actually helping them. And I make sure that all of the students are actually um, taking their struggle as a positive thing indeed they saw that the gap between minority and majority students was really small in those courses. So this kind of study, you know, should be done by instructors who already have a growth mindset themselves. And notice that it's a really short intervention where you are trying to get across that adversity is normal and adversity and, and struggling with challenging physics problems is something that is good. You should actually pat yourself on the back. This is why you are in college. You're here to learn. If you, even Einstein said, if you haven't struggled, you haven't tried to learn anything new. So do struggle, feel good about it. This is a safe environment to struggle. You know, Tell your friends in small groups that you don't know something and feel proud of it and learn with them. You know, like, and come to my office hours, come to the office hour of, you know, go to the office hour of the TA and lo and behold, in the end, you'll end up doing well. So in this case, you know, we did it as a control study, only three, uh, three instructors who were teaching like really large courses with about, you know, more than uh, 250 students or so participated and six recitations participated. So some of them were control groups and some of them were experimental groups. These six were experimental group. And notice the thing that we are trying to get across is struggling is the only way to learn something new. And so they should be proud of struggling since that means that they are already on their way to learning new things and they should be proud of doing challenging problems. And every time they struggle, they should pat themselves on their back, okay? The idea was to reduce their anxiety, reduce their procrastination, increase their enthusiasm for solving challenging problems, and ensure that the limited cognitive resources are used to solve problems as opposed to being robbed by the anxiety. Because cognitive science says that your brain, can, you know, when you're solving problems, the working memory can only have five to nine chunks, five to nine slots. And if some of those slots are being taken up by the anxiety of the problem, then you're not giving all of your cognitive resources to the problem solving process. It, this is true in addition to all the procrastinations that might be going on because of the fact that you are anxious about doing the problem because you don't want to do those kinds of things that you don't think you will be in which the outcome will be good. So you as an instructor have the power to empower your students 
with short activities that normalize adversity, that normalize struggle, and make students understand that that is actually a good thing and they should really embrace it and learn from each mistake and use it as a building block and stepping stone to learning something new. So basically, like just to summarize, this is what happened. First, you know, uh, the TAs in these classes told the students in the recitations, okay, you know, today uh, we are going to actually do an activity because physics department really wants to understand your concerns about being in this course. Here is a sheet of paper. Why don't you write about the concerns that you have about being in this physics class? And guess what? Students wrote a lot. At the end of 10 minutes, they had to be told to stop. At that point, the <clears throat> teaching assistant actually showed testimonials from previous students, you know, students from past years who had done really well, who had all gotten A grades, and what they said about what they thought about uh, being in the course. And these are real testimonials. We had combined a couple of them just to make them more succinct. And basically, they were saying, you know, when I went to this physics class, I was also concerned about how I'm going to do well, how I'm going to do but then I realized that it was really about working hard, working smart, taking advantage of all the resources, patting myself on the back, working with my other students, you know, going to the instructor's office hours, using deliberate strategies to solve challenging problems. And lo and behold, at the end, I ended up doing really well. Now, notice some of these testimonials are from people whose names look like they are white students. Some of them are non-white students. Some of them are female students. Some of them are male students. They're all saying the same thing in their own words because we wanted to normalize adversity. We wanted it to be uh, clear to the students that everybody is feeling the same way. You are not alone just because you, are a, you, know, you don't see other people like yourself. The second thing we wanted to normalize is that it's a good thing to struggle because that is a stepping stone to learning new things. And that's what these people were saying. The third thing was to put students in these recitations. These are maximum 40 students in small groups of four or five and discuss with each other what they wrote on the sheet of paper. And why don't students realize that adversity is a really normal thing? And why don't they realize that it's a good thing that they should actually be embracing their struggles and learning from all their mistakes and using that as a stepping stone to learning the learning whatever they are learning because that's why they are in college and notice that when you say why don't students realize it's like you want them to believe it that premise before they start discussing it with each other and students discussed it with each other and then final thing was to ask each group to present what they discussed and each group pretty much was saying the same thing so this was it and at the end of this thing you know some students even clapped they said you know we are so glad you did this because we were really worried otherwise about being in this class. And now we are feeling so much better. Some students are like, who's in the tower? You know, do you wanna do homework sets together? So it was really nice. So this was the thing, you know, physics department wants to hear your concerns. Then, uh, you know, this is the writing assignment that students are writing, you know, uh, at the beginning, I'm extremely worried that I have over calculated my mental abilities by ending up in this engineering program. Right now, all the information I'm learning is not even new but I'm still not seeming to do well. I mean, like it goes on and on and 95% of the students in our classes actually write these kinds of things. They're all concerned about being in the physics course. Notice that these are also freshmen. This is one of the testimonials from a student who has done really well. This is Allison, who's a Pitt electrical engineering senior. And again, there was group discussion. I already told you about, you know, if that was the end of it, we would already have felt good. But you know, at the end of the semester, when we analyze student uh, grades, what we found is that in the social belonging group, there's no difference between men and women. The dark uh, purple is women, blue is men. And in the control group, the performance of men and women is different. In fact, this is the same thing, but here we are looking at the GPA out of four. And again, this is by race and this is by gender and you see the results are very similar here the intervention group is dark uh, dark uh, blue and light blue is control group and you can see again that women and men in the intervention group are not different whereas in the control group they are and the same is true for students by race also and by the way the same similar kind of intervention was done by the colleague who helped us do this intervention in biology classes also and sound found most positive result for the students by race because their women were not 
uh, out uh, underperforming. So the model that I have for you, you know, what I want you to think about as your role as an instructor then is to think of yourself as a coach. And, you know, for too long, we have just thought of our responsibility as an instructor being like helping students develop defenses, you know, efficient problem solving, effective problem solving skills, trans transferring their learning from one situation to the other, helping them develop a good knowledge structure of physics. These are all very important, but also important is to help develop students' defense help them develop a high sense of belonging in their physics class, help them develop an identity as a person who can excel in physics, somebody who has growth mindset about their potential, that brain is a muscle that can grow by working hard, working smart, as opposed to intelligent intelligence being something immutable. Self-efficacy is, you know, again, as I said, students believe that they can excel in solving physics problems. And notice that if you actually work on these things by creating that kind of an environment where you're making students, making it very clear to students that struggling is the stepping stone to learning something new, they should be proud of it and they should be patting themselves on their back. You are going to, and, and you have high expectations of them and you know that they will actually do well. If they actually use the deliberate strategies that you are helping them, you know, use, while telling them that they can do it and you have high expectations of them, they will work hard, work smart, and they will also develop higher level of interest and they will actually have higher achievement goals for themselves. So in a safe, inclusive environment where nobody is feeling judged, you are actually going to help all students, but particularly those who are from underrepresented groups, you know, the groups that have historically been marginalized in physics, like women or racial ethnic minority students, these people have historically not been part of physics and they are the ones who are most concerned and most vulnerable if you forget about your role as helping your students with both offense and defense, just like a tennis coach. You have to work on both of these things and creating an equitable and inclusive environment means working on both offense and defense. By the way, in my uh, own research, we have seen that if you do active engagement, even if you call it evidence-based, if you don't really work on students' defenses, then basically what you see is that the gap between majority and minority student actually increases, even if all students end up learning more. So if you separate things by demographics, what you see is that the group that actually benefited the most from those group discussions and everything else that you were doing in the class were the majority students, not the other ones. They all benefited, but the gap actually increased. That's not a very equitable situation. If you want everybody to participate without feeling uh, unsafe, you know, without feeling like, oh, if I say something and it's wrong, you know, what will other people think? You know, then you should really work on the students' defenses, tell them to struggle and feel proud of it and pat themselves on their back and tell them that you know that they can get there and you have high expectation, but they should use those deliberate strategies and work with other people, take advantage of all the resources, office hours, et cetera, and th then they'll do well. By the way, the same approach is also really important for uh, making sure that students actually uh, do well in research, whether they're undergraduate or graduate students in your group. Again, you know, like in research, people are going to struggle. You know, nobody moves in a straight line. You know, you go two steps forward, one step back, you know, for sometimes you're know, three months in a row, nothing might actually look like, you know, uh, is a real progress. That is perfectly fine. And again, if especially underrepresented students or people who are actually even first time college students, people whose parents didn't go to college, they are the ones who are like most worried about or just anybody who doesn't have a role model in physics. They're like, am I doing right? Am I doing fine? You know, am I making good progress? And if you don't rec recognize them, if you don't validate them, they will think that they're not doing well and they'll drop out. So it's really important that you actually, you know, make it clear to students that they are making progress, you have high expectations and you know that they'll do well and keep supporting them, keep, uh, you know, like helping them make that progress because otherwise a lot of people who are uh, most vulnerable are the ones who are, you know, going to drop out of research as well. So I think that at this point, I'm gonna stop. I just wanted to also say that what you have to recognize is that what is important is what your impact is on students, not what your intentions are. So I'll actually uh, stop with an, uh, you know, a story 
This is a story of Eileen Pollock, who was the first woman to get a bachelor's in science in physics at Yale University in the 70s. And she now is an English professor at University of Michigan Ann Arbor. And she wrote this book in 2016 called The Only Woman in the Room. And basically she writes in this book that when she um, was at Yale in her senior year, she did a thesis project with a professor on a theoretical topic. And she said that when she solved this problem, she worked really hard. And when she solved this problem, she ran to his office because she was so excited to present this thing to him that uh, you know, she, she knocked on his door and said, hey, here it is. You know, and she was hoping that he would say, hey, Eileen, you should really go to grad school. You know, like This is awesome. And guess what? He just nodded and said, OK, nothing. And she said that she went from being you know, triumphant to feeling like she was at the bottom of the ocean. Because the fact that she didn't get recognized by this faculty, that was such a huge blow. She still felt like asking him, do you think that I'm cut out to go to grad school? But she said, if I needed to ask him, I must not be good enough. So you know, she was so dejected by not getting that validation, not being told, hey, this is great. You know, you, you did a good job. You know, you should consider going to grad school that she basically just quit physics. She saw that she was also good at writing. So she was like, maybe I should just like do my uh, graduate work in English. And there she is, right? But of course, physics was her first love. So when she's writing this book 30 years later, she went back to Yale. And this person who was her thesis advisor was now the undergraduate like director and so this time she met him over uh, breakfast and outright with more maturity asked him what he thought about her undergraduate thesis. And he said, oh, Eileen, you know, not that many people do theoretical work for undergraduate thing. Yours, must, yours was truly exceptional. And she said, really? Why didn't you tell me then? Do you ever praise anybody? And do you ever say to anybody that, you know, they should go to grad school? And he said, no, I don't, because you know, physics grad school is so hard. I don't want people to give the wrong to get the wrong impression. You know, if anybody wants to go, they should just decide for themselves, you know, like they should know what they are doing. But the point is, if this is the way that you are actually validate, not validating your students, then the one not affirming your students, the impact that you're having on the students is not good. In fact, if you actually are more you know, into validation, into affirming your students and praising them for the progress and telling them that you have high expectation and you know that they can get there, they will work harder, they will work smarter, they will actually do even more work because they now are excited that you actually think of them as a physicist, you think of them as somebody who can be good at this. And the point is that if you don't, then the people who are most vulnerable are the ones who have historically been underrepresented, women, racial, I think minority students, first generation students, low income students, they are the ones who are more likely to quit. But notice that all the things that are good for them are good for all students. So I would just like to say, remember your impact. We have like the best job in the world and we can really empower our students to do their best and be the best if we actually keep validating them, keep affirming them. So I'd like to stop here and take any questions. Thank you. Hey, thank you. That was a great talk and a great note to end on. Um, so I guess, yeah, let's open it up for questions. Uh, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand. And I see we, uh, Zach has raised his hand already. So do you want to go ahead, Zach, with your question? Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so I, I was wondering if you know if any of, uh, if this sort of research has been done at the high school level, because I know for a lot of high school students, they encounter high school or even AP physics, and it's just something that doesn't make a lot of sense to them. Um, and I, I feel like we could be weeding out a number of potentially very capable physicists who never got encouragement at the high school level uh, in the same way that we're weeding out physicists at the co collegiate level. Thank you, Zach. 
So, so high school level, these studies have actually been done at the high school level a lot, but mainly in the math courses. So in fact, the, the original study, the most, uh, you know, like the study that is cited the most in this literature is from 1999, done by Carol Dwake and uh, Mueller at uh, Stanford University, and they did it in high school math classes. And, and basically the same instructor taught three different courses, right? They, they were the same course, course they, they were the same course, but three different sections of the course, right? In one course, the instructor was promoting growth mindset, you know, like, so every time he would return students work, he would say, John, I see that you've made really great progress this time, you know, your, your, your homework or quiz is really good, you must have worked really hard and really smart, you know, that kind of thing, as opposed to like another section where he would say somebody who would do well, he would say, oh, you are really smart. You must be really smart. And the person who would not be good, it would be like, hmm. So it somehow was giving the impression in one case that intelligence was immutable versus in the other case that it was really working hard, working smart, you know, struggling, you know, using your struggle as stepping stone to learning that was important. And the third group, the, inst the same instructor didn't say anything. And what they found is that even though at the beginning of the course, there was no difference in student performances at the pre-test level, at the end of the course, these students had diverged in terms of where they were. And in fact, not only had they diverged in terms of their performance, if, you, if the teacher actually looked at how the students were doing on any optional task that he would give in the class, the students who were in the growth mindset section, you know, like where they were being told that struggling is the stepping stone to learning new things and they should be struggling, they should be proud of it, and they should work hard, work smart, and use deliberate strategies. Students wanted to do challenging problems. Every time there was an option, they would be like, I want to do challenging problems. You know, on the other hand, in the group in which like he was like, Oh, John, you are brilliant. Every time somebody did well, and you know, he would make other people who didn't do well feel like they were not you know because if you're telling that to some people who have worked who have, who have done well and not to other people that's what they are thinking even though you don't say that explicitly so in math courses you know there has been a lot of studies done at the high school level that have you know kind of shown repeatedly these kinds of things but not in the context of physics somehow like those people who are uh social scientists, they have been more interested in math education. So I guess physicists will have to take up these things on their own. But I do agree with you that it will be good to do it at the high school level as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, more questions? Uh, go ahead, Phil. Uh, on the topic of self-confidence and bring, giving self-confidence to women students. Uh, my own experience from uh, 60 years ago was that uh, I was in a class of uh, probably 30 physics majors of whom two were women, the rest men. And um, the women told us that when they went for an interview, the professor interviewing them um, told them, well, you probably will be only one of two women in the class because historically we've had just two women in the class. And uh, I I'd struggled with thinking about this because I could see how very discouraging it was, but at the same time, I think he thought he was being helpful in saying, well, perhaps you wouldn't be comfortable in a class where you're only in such a minority and informing them in advance so that they weren't surprised. Um, I was wondering what your reaction would, would be to that anecdote. Thank you, Phil. I mean, like you really are making the point that I was trying to make, which is that, you know, it's not your um, intentions that matter, it's the impact that you're having. And that's exactly what you're talking about. You know, even in other contexts, you know, one of the things that I have found in my own research, you know, is that I've done a lot of interviews, the PhD students that I've worked with, they have done a lot of interviews. And one thing that we find repeatedly in physics courses is that, you know, instructors and TAs, when students go to, um, 
to ask them questions about homework or something like that, they'll say, this problem is trivial. This problem is obvious. This problem is easy. The point is, again, you know, those people, maybe they don't have bad intentions, but the kind of impact that they are having on the students, and especially the ones who are already questioning whether they have what it takes to excel. So these students who are underrepresented, they feel like somebody is slapping them on their you know, uh, cheek and telling them that they're not smart enough to be in this class because, you know, they already struggle with it for so long. And this person is called saying this problem is trivial. Similarly, if somebody actually says at the beginning of a course, you know, oh, I'm delighted to be here, but you know what, 20% of this class is going to fail. Again, this is a horrible thing to say, because on the first day of class, you've really crushed you know, the students who are most vulnerable, the ones who are underrepresented are the ones who are likely to think maybe they are the ones who are going to be like this, the ones who came from failing infrastructure, because everybody has the prerequisites to be in that course, otherwise they wouldn't be there. Yes, there is a distribution, but you know, our job, and especially today with digital technology and everything else and all, if all the other things that we can give to the students, we can try to actually help students do a lot of things outside and then do a lot of active learning stuff inside and make sure that you know, we help all of our students, but the point is that the ones who are, you know, least privileged to begin with are the ones who are going to say, what's the point of even trying if this professor is telling me that this is what his experience has been. And I, I, I'm one of, I'm, I must be one of those people who's gonna fail. So I totally agree with you. You know, we need to own our impact and we need to actually, you know, think about how we can really empower our students and create opportunities so that you know all of the students have the opportunity to do their very best. Thank you. Thank you. So I should mention that uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to at some point transition from the formal uh, Q and A to more informal discussion. Um, in fact, maybe we'll take only one more question and then we'll transition uh, to, to informal discussion. Um, uh, okay, I see Kathy has her hand up. Do you want to go, Kathy? Yeah, so Chandralekha, to follow up on um, Zach's question, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about some of the initiatives that the AAPT has in the high school um, arena to try to combat some of what you were talking about. So what were you like, thinking about, Kathy? Like step up and things like that. Okay, so yeah, so a, so we have a program called Step Up. This is like APT and APS, both of them. And uh, this particular thing is uh, especially to help women and racial ethnic minority students. It started out with just Step Up for women, but then it was you know broadened to include other underrepresented students also. So there are two kinds of things that happen in Step Up, you know, like, and this is basically to get high school students again to empower their students, right? Just the kind of thing that you were saying, Zach. And there are two things that they're really focusing on a lot. One is um, that you can do well in physics. There are lots of diverse careers in physics. And also that you know adversity is something that is good. And by being you, you can make a difference. So I think that you know a lot of times people don't want to go into physics because they're like, oh, other people are not there who look like me, so I'm not going to go. But I think that there is this uh, thing where if the teachers, if the high school physics teachers empower the students and especially encourage the underrepresented students and validate them and affirm them and recognize them and tell them, tell them that they are good at it, then the idea is, and tell them that there are lots of different types of careers in, you know, after you actually get a degree in physics and by being you, even though there might not be a lot of women or there might not be a lot of racial and ethnic minority students, by being you in this discipline, you will really actually make a difference to the discipline itself. You are actually um, getting more people to think about physics as a career. So this is a program, you know, which is supported by National Science Foundation that APT and APS have. Um, all right. So uh, I think what we'll do is now we'll transition to more informal discussion. Uh, everybody's welcome to stick around. We'll just stay in this Zoom room. 
uh, we'll just not be recording and you know we can mingle more informally. Uh, but uh, let's just take this moment to thank our speaker. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.